the changing way of life during the 19th century as we switched from working our own family farm within the neighborhood to being factory workers. Nothing about today's big government, big business, or even our neighborhoods makes any sense until we learn of the social consequences of our switch from working the family farm to being factory workers. In the early 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution was developing in England and Europe, in New England we were living in communities of single-family farms. A typical family lived in a small house located on their own farmland, not in town. Each farmhouse was within sight of those of a number of other families because the farmhouses were separated by the lanes of the farmland. You could see the candlelight of your neighbor's home from your own front door. Nylander explains that as you approached your neighbor's doorway, you would likely hear the whir of the spinning wheel and the thump of the butter churn. Nylander explains that in the evening, the family and guests gather around the snug fireside to sing, play music, sew, knit, make buttons, whittle clothespins and such, repair harnesses or furnishings, and to listen while one person reads aloud from a book of fiction, poetry, dramatic plays, philosophy, theology, or even chemistry. Nylander explains that relatives and neighbors enter households freely in an active coming and going to share joys and sorrows and to offer assistance, advice, and support. The same girls who work together as adolescents spinning thread and husking corn will soon fit each other's wedding gown, run their own hospitable kitchens, encourage each other during labor, and have established places in the community. The community has its sages, high spirits, willing helpers, and busybodies. The household feeds any friend or relative who happens to be in the area at mealtime and will put them up for the night when overtaken by darkness or weather. Refreshments are given to any neighbor or stranger who walks by or asks for information or is chasing an errant animal or looking for berries to gather. Food and a bed is given to traveling peddlers and those who repair shoes, baskets, or tinware and such. They might sleep in the barn, by the fireplace, or even in bed with everyone else. In one week, a house might receive visits from brothers, aunts, cousins, cousins of cousins, and friends. Most would be fed and some would spend the night. A visiting woman might share the bed with the wife and husband of the house. Visitors often bring their sewing and such so that they can work while chatting and sharing news. A shopkeeper's home is especially busy. In one month, the household might make 100 extra meals and have 70 overnight guests who have come to conduct business and will join in whatever work is being done. Less visiting occurs during the busy spring and fall portions of the agricultural cycle. More visiting occurs when snow cover makes for easy travel by sleigh. Sleighs enable one to visit a home even 10 miles away and return the same evening. A full moon provides light into the evening, which is something that today's big city dwellers do not notice because of the bright street lights. Several sleighs full of people might travel together to drink at a tavern. Hawk explains that the farmhouse was not an isolated entity, but a focal point of the neighborhood, which extends outward in a radius of about one day's travel. The extended family members and their wards living in this area cooperate as a unit. A call for help from a faraway relative is answered. This unit performed all the functions that the medieval European village had done, including the care of sick, indigent, orphaned, 
decrepit, and senile. In New England, it takes the combined efforts of many persons working all day long just to maintain the household. The well-working home was said to be a well-regulated home. A lone person cannot do all that is needed. When one woman becomes ill, the other women of the house must fill in for her by working extra hours, and there is extra help from women of the neighboring homes. The same thing occurs when a man is ill. To repay for the knitting help done by a neighboring woman today, a man might go to her house tomorrow to chop wood. He will be fed while he is working there until evening. A woman might sew a shirt for a man who is helping thresh wheat at her house. Household women performed a variety of so-called earning work that could be exchanged for credit at stores or was done on a day labor basis within the community's web of exchanges. Nylander explains that people having rum drinks at a tavern might pay with potatoes, fish, turnips, butter, beef, veal, or pork. Here is a list of the payments received by Asa Talcott, who was a tailor and part-time farmer. Most every specialist was also a part-time farmer. We can imagine that some farmers knew that Talcott was fond of salmon and would give a higher value to it than would the miller. Talcott would exchange the received items and his own services and surplus food to the other people in the community. And the tailor sometimes made clothing for motherless children. In big cities, actual cash is more often used. Shop owners indicate whether they accept the bartering of so-called country pay or if they accept cash only. Less than half of Talcott's tailoring work is spent making new clothes. Mostly, he repairs clothes to extend their usable lifetime. Farmers often bring cloth to the tailor to fit and cut, and then the farmer takes the pieces back home to sew themselves. The farmer contracted with the specialist in this so-called bespoke work. The same web of exchanges occurs among farmers, potters, butchers, millers, coopers, ministers, tanners, carpenters, lawyers, doctors, and other specialists. Each specialist is also a part-time farmer, hayer, sower, harvester, and maple syrup maker. Many specialties are seasonal. Those involving water mills cannot be done in the winter when the weather freezes water. The work of each family member contributes to the well-being of all. Most work provides food, clothing, heat, or light. The family is not self-sufficient in food and goods, but the entire village as a whole is nearly self-sufficient. Within the homes of the community, Mothers loan and borrow items and the labor of themselves and their children on a daily basis. Each mother knows the equipment and talents of every family. Nylander says that neighboring mothers trade the help of daughters just as they trade pots. Each woman keeps mental notions of exchange balances rather than written tallies. In the community system of exchange, New Englanders ask themselves, what labor and goods should we trade with which neighbors so that we, or they, can accomplish this or that? A child went to work young. Daniel Drake of Mazelik, Kentucky, described his childhood chores. At the age of eight, he rode on a horse to steady it while his father plowed. He planted seeds as his father covered them. He weeded. He stood guard over the crops by throwing rocks at squirrels and crows. He cared for stock, and he chopped and hauled wood. At eleven, he was given an old gun to scare pests from the field. At twelve, he held the plow and guided the horse himself. At thirteen, he split rails and built fences. By sixteen, he was doing a full man's work in the fields. Danielle's sister Lizzie, at the age of ten, was sent to a farm one mile away 
to watch over twins and their aged father for an entire week. She had complete charge of the house. She woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, walked a distance to get water, made breakfast, and got the children ready for school. She then cleaned the dishes and began preparing dinner. Within the home, hired help was not paid in cash. Instead, helpers move into your house and exchange their labor for your food and clothing and education. The hired help became part of the family. Similarly, apprentices moved into the homes of their trainers. Each city had one dozen night watchmen working in pairs, watching for fires, and calling out on the hour that two of the clock and all is well. The twelve watchmen are the closest thing to a police force. The town's residents were the fire department. An alarm brought everyone out to quickly form a double line between the burning building and the nearest stream or well. Each household brought a fire bucket which was made of leather and might be marked with the family's name or initials. Water-filled buckets were passed along one of the two lines and the empty buckets were passed back along the other line. When finished, everyone retrieved their bucket. Both the original purpose and manifestations of our social genes are demonstrated as the community pools efforts on chores deemed larger than one person can do alone. A large field is best cut and harvested on a singularly appropriate day. The help of many persons from the community is beneficial in accomplishing this chore and to do it in one day. The neighboring families combine efforts and the nearby town is emptied as its merchants close shop to join in the project. Haying is handled with the excitement of a battle. Lines of people with long handled cysts work across the field. A slow cutter would, would receive friendly insults. Young men consider hang to be a physical challenge and a contest and strive to be considered the best mower or to be assigned head of a group. This work lasted 14 to 16 hours through the long summer day from dawn until dusk and even later during the bright light of a full moon. Cutting hay required the most work of all. Potatoes, oats, rye, corn, and wheat were harvested later in the year and did not require such a frantic rush as did haying. Threshing grain was done in the 10,000 year old labor intensive fashion. Harvested corn is stacked into a number of high piles. Neighboring families come to help remove the corn husk from each ear. Groups were assigned to each pile and then races would occur. Finding a lucky red ear meant pending courtship. Shucking corn was an occasion for celebration, and every celebration involved heavy drinking and dancing. Alice Earle explains that after a heavy snow, community members used oxen-powered plows to push the snow off the roads. Everyone joined in to clear the roads because everyone needed to go to the school, church, post office, and town and be able to make social visits. Plowing began with those living farthest out of town. As they traveled inward, they were joined by others and their oxen. A tired ox would be left in someone's barn to be retrieved later. All raced toward the center of town where roads converged. There would be dozens of oxen and sleighs parked at the tavern. Community members would walk as far as 10 miles to meet at a homestead that needed trees to be cut down or needed rocks to be cleared from a field. 
Cut trees are left to dry for several months before everyone gathers again to drag away and pile up the logs. Accidents and injuries might occur while working as men would drink much rum. Everyone helped, including the Supreme Court Justice who lived in the area. Neighbors also worked the crop field of a sick person. People would meet to raise up a building, which might be a barn, church, or a school. They might break a bottle of rum over the central ridge pole. While we observe this modern day barn raising by an Amish community, we'll discuss the aspect of human nature that is the exchange of mutual assistance. We see that a few days help in harvesting might be traded for help in spinning thread, shucking corn, peeling apples, or tailoring a shirt. Some firewood or meat might be traded for the loan of a horse or wagon, or maybe for a few weeks' pasturing of a cow. Neighboring families exchanged goods, utensils, and the help of themselves and their children. No money was paid in these help exchanges, but mental balances were kept. Neighbors exchanged help in doing many chores, but especially in those that were large or had to be done so quickly, such as in cutting the hay field. Soon after new families moved into a New England community, they were quickly entangled in the local system of exchanging goods and help. Everyone gave and received strength, time, and goodwill. The community was a social contract. These agricultural examples of mutual aid among neighbors is similar to those of other times and places. We saw that a group of Yoruba farming families might work one farmland at a time and that medieval European villagers might work the entire crop field as a community. Our biological ancestors first formed societies because they found it mutually beneficial to exchange assistance in any task that was larger than could be handled by one individual. That is the golden social rule. The original tasks were looking for food and watching for predators. A lone ancestor would not survive for long. Ever since we first became social primates a few million years ago, we have known that our lives depend on the continued and smooth functioning of our society. If the social group unravels, then we would again be going it alone. This is why we are deeply upset by anything, from a fist fight to a crime, that disrupts our society. This is why the news of a murder properly upsets you and all other members of your social group. We are a social species. We innately know that the end of society would mean the end of our own lives. We can now see that the farming families of 1820 New England were simply doing the same thing. In today's push-button big city, we have fewer reasons to exchange assistance with our neighbors because very few chores require the efforts of more than one person or more than a few moments of time. Moving day is one of our largest chores. During the switch from farming to factory work through the 1800s, there was much contemporary discussion about the readily apparent lessening in community ties since factory workers were finding fewer reasons to exchange help with their neighbors than had their farming parents. Those of us human beings who are Amish prefer to pool efforts as a community rather than work alone using a machine that does the work of many persons but breaks the ties among community members. Because we are a social species, some of us who live in the big city today naturally get an ill feeling in our stomach about our seemingly insufficiently connected society. Neighbors still help each other the instant a need arises, but it often acquires a natural disaster to produce a visible need to which we will then innately respond. And we are then relieved to see the exchange of help because it makes us feel that we are members of a society after all. The innate feeling that is propelling you to exchange help with other people is the same feeling and drive that was experienced by our distant biological ancestors beginning several million years ago. This urge to exchange assistance creates a social species. Without this urge, a species does not become social. Social systems and the golden social rule necessarily occur as a pair. 
As Johnson explains, that feeling is like a little emotional packet that has traveled through time, connecting you to the first humans, and even to your more remote social primate ancestors. The urge we feel to exchange help and to pool resources today is the same feeling and mental state experienced by our first social primate ancestors. Whether exchanging help in the search for food and warning of predators, or in the 19th century chore of harvesting the hay crop. Today's individual acts of mutual assistance are due to the same innate drive to cooperate that has existed since we first became social primates. Our mutually beneficial exchange of help today merely occurs in a less directly visible manner as each of us contributes to the operation of our society by working our daily job. Our civilization is the sum of the efforts of each of us. On the surface, our daily lives today seem more independent of the other members of our community than occurred in the early 1800s, but our mix of specialized occupations actually makes us more interdependent today than we have ever been in our past. Our interdependence is visible as the traffic seen to occur as everyone is going about their daily jobs that combine into our civilization. Our civilization operates today only because of the combined efforts of all of us doing our daily job. It is not everyone for themselves in our society today. We are pulling efforts every day. Each of us contributes our lifetime's effort in keeping our civilization going and in pushing its progress.